Hi everyone, welcome to our second week in our cover to cover Bible study for summer 2022. Today we get to cover what I'm sure is everybody's favorite book of the Bible, Leviticus. I'm saying that dripping with sarcasm, by the way, if you could see my face, um, but it's actually something worthwhile to cover. And here's an instance where hopefully I didn't give you too much reading in Leviticus to cause you to fall asleep, but I think you'll find the lecture to be very beneficial because it'll just help put some order um, and some clarity to what we're reading there. So we're going to talk through Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Hopefully this will be not quite as long as the last lecture set, which was Genesis and Exodus. But again, this is like kind of core things to understand, especially some of what's going on in Leviticus is actually foundational to understanding what happens to the nation of Israel and why they fall so hard. Um, so we'll see how we do. If I feel like it's getting too long, I'll try to break it up again like I did with Genesis and Exodus so that you can you know kind of listen and watch in chunks okay so um, hopefully you have the slide set that you can follow along with um, so if you look at the next page on the slide um, and for those of you listening I have the PowerPoint presentations included on our newsletter so you can always go and download that or even print it off and either follow along later or you know check in with what I've been saying so this map is kind of is going to help us situate ourselves in history um, as we work our way through these books so I didn't talk about it too much last week because I didn't have as much time but you can see we begin the map it starts up in the left corner and it kind of winds its way across so there's four lines if, if we could we would stretch this out into one big line but of course there's not room so it starts at creation goes to Joseph and the tribes to Egypt and then the next thing that happens is Sinai and it continues like that so creation of course can't can't date it that's one of the questions and the, the big mysteries is when exactly did all of that happen when did God create the world how old is the world when did the events of that primeval history happen we really don't get into datable history until we get to the patriarchs and then yes we can actually begin to correlate archaeological findings and records of some of the names of these people with what we're reading in the biblical accounts. So the patriarchs come into, you know, into the picture somewhere around 2000 BC. Joseph goes to Egypt around 1800. Remember from last week, there's a bunch of debate about when the Exodus happens. Um, this timeline has it at 1446. I tend to favor um, the 1250 date, but either one, there's support for both options. Um, then we have 40 years where they wander in the desert. We're going to talk about that today. So today we are focused in on that little piece. Sinai will actually kind of, you know, up from Egypt to Sinai to the desert wanderings. And then next week we'll pick up the story with Joshua. So here, I showed you this last week, is sort of a rough timeline of the events of the first five books of the Bible. So again, we have that like prehistory, primeval history happening in Genesis 1 through 11. It's not datable. Uh, then we have the time of the patriarchs. That's Genesis 12 through 50. That covers about a hundred, a couple of hundred years in time. Um, Exodus 1 through 3 spans hundreds of years, like 400 something years, because we leave, um, we close out Genesis with Joseph and the Israelites safely ensconced in Egypt. And of course we begin, they're still in Egypt, but they are under oppression and several, several generations have gone by. Then um, once they, they Moses kind of is raised up as a leader by God and all the events happen and the Exodus itself is Exodus 4 uh, through like 15 and then from 15 to Numbers 10 10 we're dealing with wandering a little bit of wandering getting to Mount Sinai and then they camp out there and they are there for you know like nine months uh, really getting everything you know the the tablets with the Ten Commandments on it, the incident with the golden calf happens, the um, construction or pr preparations for the movable tabernacle, all of this is occurring at the foot of Mount Sinai. And then in Numbers 10, they finally set off for their journey to the Promised Land. And that ends up being a 40-year journey, which we'll get into in our lecture. 
And then the final piece of the Pentateuch is the book of Deuteronomy. And it really is representative of one day, kind of in parentheses, like it's the greatest hits of Moses' sermons, if you will. Um, so it, it's not a huge timeline that we're covering. And it's really actually turns out to be a pretty good review of everything that we've read in Exodus through Numbers. And so in your readings, I didn't give you a ton in Deuteronomy because it's very repetitive of things that we have already studied. So here's our framework, again, situating ourselves within the Old Testament. So this is what we talked through last week, Genesis through Exodus. And now we're in this Exodus, you know, we're emerging from Exodus to talk about Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So I talked about this last week. Just want to bring it up again because we are talking about laws when we get to the book of Leviticus. Uh, remember that we as humans and scholars have created sort of categories with which to make sense of all of these different laws that we come across here in the Pentateuch. So there's moral laws, which is, you know, like the Ten Commandments, things that make sense, they're reasonable, there are th laws that we might create even if we didn't believe in God, murder is wrong, lying is wrong, coveting someone else's things are wrong. Um, of course, the first Ten Commandments really are very situational to one's relationship with the one true God, but the moral part of that is definitely something that I think most of society would agree with. Um, there's disagreement about the laws concerning human sexuality. Some people, um, people with what we would say more conservative theology, uh, will argue that those are also moral laws. And we'll talk about this when we get to the New Testament because we will see a lot of discussion around human sexuality in the New Testament. Uh, but then other people say, no, those are part of the ceremonial and judicial laws that governed people in Old Testament times. And so because of that, they have actually been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So hold on to that. I know it's a hot topic in our current modern day times, but we will get to that more in the New Testament. And then we have very clear ceremonial laws. These are things related to worship, um, everything we're going to talk about in Leviticus with the sacrificial system and cleanliness. These have all been fulfilled, praise the Lord, by Jesus Christ. And so we who now believe in God through faith in Jesus Christ do not have to worry about sacrifices or, you know, ceremonial washing to remove um, impurity from us. And then there's judicial laws. These are laws just governing the community. They were, again, specific to the time and the place and the people. They're also no longer relevant. For example, don't wear more than two types of cloth in one garment. You know, don't cook a goat in its mother's milk. And actually, even those laws have a lot to do with combating pagan practices. So the pagans would do these things. And so God is handing this law down through Moses to say, you need to be set apart from the rest of the people in this area. Um, and so I'm doing that by creating these judicial laws to govern you. So here is a picture of Mount Sinai as it is in modern day times. The structure that you see there is a monastery, but I just, for those of you who have not been to um, the Middle East, I just wanted to give you kind of a picture. It's, it's quite impressive. And so you can imagine in the place of this monastery, you know, encampments with all these people. And then imagine Moses going up to the top of this mountain and it being shrouded in clouds and fire. And just what an impressive and scary and amazing sight that that would have been. So the names of the biblical books, um, I didn't talk about this last week because it didn't have time, but I don't want to not talk about it. Um, in Hebrew, the books are titled based on the opening words. So Genesis in Hebrew is, is the Hebrew for in the beginning. Exodus in Hebrew would be the names of. And then um, the Greek version comes along and gives them titles. And that's where we get Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And so that comes from the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which again happens around the time of Alexander the Great. We'll talk more about this in our intertestamental lecture. But um, our titles are based on that version, the Greek, Greek translation of the Old Testament. So author, 
same as last week. These first five books of the Bible are attributed to Moses, but not Moses alone. Um, he didn't put all of it into written form. This was added to by scribes and editors, uh, mostly during the time of the kings, but even some portions come into fruition during exile and even after exile. So it's as they become more established as a nation, then they set down the process of, okay, now we need to put all these stories that we have into a cohesive written form. So Leviticus in Hebrew means, and the Lord called or worship. And in Greek, it's Leviticus, which means related to the Levites. Remember, um, the Levites are the tribe that is, you know, over the whole priesthood system. So this book is the heart of the Pentateuch. It is the middle book of the first five books of the Bible. That means that we need to pay attention to it. This means that it's significant. <clears throat> as dry as it is for the people living in in the ancient Near East, these newly formed, you know, Israelites, they come together and God names them as a nation and calls them to be his people. We saw that in Exodus. He gives them a mission to fulfill, which is to make God's name known, to be this priesthood of believers. So this book is their lifeblood. It is key. It teaches them how exactly they go about being God's people. What rules do they need to follow? What terms and conditions are part of being the covenantal people of God? And what does worship look like? And how do we hold, you know, the priesthood in that day accountable and make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do in their roles? And the big underlying question of Leviticus and really everything else we're going to read, well, that we have read this um, coming week was, God's made this, this ragtag bunch of people into this nation, how to maintain that relationship. Um, God knows that once they move forward from Mount Sinai, they're going to be headed to the promised land. And the promised land is filled with people who do not worship the one true God. They engage in all sorts of cultic pagan practices. And so they're going to be confronted on all sides by these temptations to kind of resort to the ways of the rest of the ancient Near East. Peer pressure, like on steroids, if you will. And so God needs to set down clear boundaries so that they can stay faithful to their mission as, God pe as God's people. And so we're going to find that the word holy appears 90 times in Leviticus, and that becomes the key. You have to be holy because I am holy, God says. And what does holy mean? It means set apart, different from the rest of the people around you, so that you can then be people amongst whom God lives. We'll talk about this in a second. <clears throat> So Leviticus functions as a book of worship, as a book of law for the people, and as a way to hold the priesthood accountable. Um, it, you know, they couldn't just trust that the priesthood would go on as it was supposed to. The people needed to ensure that the priests were holding up their end of the bargain because the priesthood, as we're going to learn, is the conduit between God and the rest of the Israelite people. So the, the structure of Leviticus, the first 17 chapters, really concern the way to access God, how to maintain this relationship with a God that is so holy when human beings are so very not holy. So we're going to talk about the ways in which God says they are to do this. And then in chapters 18 through 27, we're really looking at the way to walk with God. How do we live this out as God's people? So sacrifices, any Israelite can spontaneously offer one of the sacrifices that we're going to talk about, always with the help and aid of the priests. The priest's job were to preside over these sacrifices, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, and then the priests themselves had daily sacrifices that they had to engage in. So every morning, and we think also every evening, they would have presented what was called a whole burnt offering with a grain offering. And this is every single day, no matter if 55 people come with, 
you know, extra sacrifices or nobody comes or it's a festival day and every single family shows up with their goat that they're going to sacrifice. Um, this, it doesn't matter. Irregardless, the priest had to present these sacrifices. And then in between this, people could come with their own personal sacrifices. So sacrifices fall into two categories, sweet aroma sacrifices and expiation and forgiveness sacrifices. So the sweet aroma category includes that whole burnt offering, which was again supposed to be offered definitely every morning and scholars think based on you know what they read in Leviticus that it was also done in the evening as well and these were to just atone for basic human sinfulness humans being humans they're gonna mess up they're gonna do things wrong and so every day we're just gonna do this to kind of cover the bases if you will then there were grain offerings or Thanksgiving offerings these could be standalone you know a family has a child, a baby is born, and the family wants to give thanks for that blessing. Or they can accompany the whole burnt offering because individuals also can come with a whole burnt offering. And we'll talk about that in a second. And then there's peace or fellowship offerings. These are offerings just intended to be praise to God. Then we have the second category, which is probably what we think of more when we think of sacrifices, is expiation and forgiveness. And there's two main types, basically two types in general. Um, there's a purification offering or sin offering. And this was to make atonement or restitution for an unwitting sin, but it doesn't involve financial restitution or anything like physical to be done with another human being. This is just a sin that you committed and then you need to, to make it right with God. A guilt or trespass offering is to atone for a sin that also requires like finance, most of the time financial restitution. So this could be um, your cow or bull uh, got out and gored your neighbor's you know, animal and it killed the animal. Um, that would be considered a sin because you, it was the shedding of blood, so it needed to be atoned for, but also restitution needs to be provided. So we're, we'll see in the Levitical laws that God will say, you need to, you know, pay back or provide an animal to replace the animal that was killed. And all of the animals that are offered as sacrifices had to be wild. Um, or sorry, couldn't be wild. They had to cost something. So if you're bringing a sin offering, it would have been an animal unless you were very, very poor. Um, and it had to be an animal from your flock. You couldn't just go out and see if you could capture a cow randomly in the desert and bring it back and say, okay, well, here's my sin offering because that doesn't cost you anything. So the idea is that a sacrifice is costly. So whole burnt offerings, this is also, you know, it's what they did every day. It covers the basis for sins and it's an act of worship. It shows the worshipers total devotion to God. Um, the entire sacrifice is fully burned on the, on the altar. And we're going to see that some sacrifices aren't. Some sacrifices, parts of it are burnt and given to God and other parts, something else happens. Um, what type of animal is offered depends on the person's financial status. So here's a little bit of grace and mercy from God. He's not asking every single person to provide a male ox because that would have been quite expensive. Um, there are provisions for lesser animals if you don't have the means to, you know, bring an ox. So if you are very well to do, you would provide a male ox. All of these have to be without blemish. If a moderately middle class, as it were, you would bring a male sheep or goat, again, without blemish. And if you were very poor, you could bring a dove or a pigeon. And by without blemish, we mean, you know, you couldn't bring um, an ox that only had three legs or one that had been wounded and so was out of commission. Because again, the idea is you're bringing your best. You're bringing something that costs you. It's not like, oh, my sheep got injured, and so I might as well just use that as a sacrifice because otherwise I'd have to kill the sheep anyway. That's not the idea. The idea is you're bringing your very best. And then the worshiper actually participated 
with the priest in the rendering of this offering. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. So the ritual of offering a bull, um, it, the citizen would bring the bull, again, has to be without blemish, or if it's not a bull, you know, whatever, the goat or the pigeon, the citizen would lay his hand on the offering, and then the citizen, the person bringing the offering, would actually do the slaughtering. So if it's the priest making his morning whole burnt offering, obviously the priest is going to be doing the slaughtering. But if it's a person bringing the whole burnt offering as a sin offering or some uh, something else, uh, the person is going to engage in the slaughter. Then the priest takes that blood and sprinkles it on the altar. The citizen then cuts and skins the animal. The priest arranges the animal and gets the fire ready. The citizen washes the animal off and the priest burns the fat. So you can see it's a joint effort here in making this sacrificial offering. Now a grain offering is is different obviously by the name. This is an act of worship as well. Um, it usually accompanies a burnt or a fellowship offering. So you would bring it alongside your bull or goat or pigeon. And it was to be made, again, of the finest flour. Here we're going with, you know, you are bringing your very best to God. It was brushed with olive oil and incense, um, that incense being frankincense, with if, which if you know the story of Jesus and the Christmas story, that's one of the spices that um, the three kings bring when they come to worship the baby Jesus. Um, the bread or the Grain offering would be salted and always it was to be without yeast. And these could be thick loaves, thin loaves, or griddle cakes, kind of like our version of a pancake. And the worshiper would provide the food, the priest would burn some of it and then keep some of it. So unlike the whole burnt offering, the priest actually gets a portion of the grain offering and they get to keep it as food for themselves. This is how God provides for the priests because they're so busy engaging in the duties of being a priest that they can't go off and hunt or farm their own land. So they're provided for out of some of these offerings that people bring. And the peace fellowship offering is just what it sounds like, a means of having fellowship with God. Um, often this is something that would occur at one of the festivals. And so it's a communal meal. It's held before Adonai with sacrifice of, you know, in one of these types. So of these, we have a thank offering. This is an, a blessing or deliverance. Um, a baby is born. Someone he is healed from a sickness. <clears throat> and so there's public thanksgiving and rejoicing. Again, the celebration of festivals would have incorporated this, uh, remembering all the wonderful things that God has done for them. <clears throat> and then there's a votive offering. So this is similar to a thank offering, but it's specific and that it's in response to a vow that has been completed. So perhaps you have a child who has vowed to you know, be um, a Nazarite. We're going to see see those when we get to the time of the kings. Um, and so when that time of service is done, then it's the vow has been completed. And so there's an offering kind of sealing that that is the fulfillment of the vow that was made. And then there's what's called a free will offering. This is just general joy and love and thankfulness towards God. I just love God and I want to express that by giving an offering. So um, the requirements for this type of offering is different than for that of a sin offering or the whole burnt offering. Um, so the thank votive offerings could be were, were to be unblemished, so that's the same, but here you can also bring a female. So if you notice for the whole burnt offerings, it had to be an unblemished male. Now you can bring a female, ox, sheep, or goat. For the free will off offering, you can bring, again, male or female, and here, mild imperfections are okay. Because remember, the free will offering is just general love, so it's not like you're not bringing an offering to be a sacrifice. It's not um, restitution or making up for something that you've done wrong. It's just a general offering, so God says it's okay if there's mild imperfections there. You still don't want to bring, like, the worst animal you have, but it also, you know, you can deal with a little bit of imperfection there. So in these type of offerings, certain parts go to God and certain parts 
go to the priest and certain parts go to the worshipers. Very interesting. So the fatty portions, usually the fat always goes to God. That's considered like the best choicest part of the animal. And so they would be burned up, which means it's going to God. Then when you read, you might notice that there's a lot of waving and heaving going on symbolic of something so they would literally wave the breast back and forth like a flag um, and then that part would go to the high priest for food and then they would heave <laughs> which you know kind of wave is a more horizontal motion heaving i think of like vertical heave the foreleg and that would be giving to the officiating priest so the high there's multiple priests multiple different um, places where they're preparing these offerings and so the high priest is usually presiding over everything maybe not engaged in the individual offerings probably did uh, engage in the whole burnt offering that happened every morning so but he still needs food so the breast goes to him and then the foreleg goes to the actual priest that's participating in you know creating the fire and and standing there with a worshiper as they give their offering and these had to be eaten in a clean place and by clean we don't mean like physically clean although that's also true but we mean like a purified place so usually within the temple grounds they couldn't take this and exit the temple area and go into the tents where the rest of the people were living they had to eat it you know in their place of business and then the remainder so not the breast not the foreleg and not the fatty portions but everything else from the animal was given to the worshipers. So they would combine all these offerings and the people would eat it as a communal meal. So again, a lot of times these offerings are associated with festivals and kind of everyone's gathering together to celebrate. Um, the, so just like the burnt offering, the whole burnt offering, the worshiper it also engages in um, this offering sacrifice as well. Okay, so let's talk about what we really think of when we think of sacrifices, the sin and the guilt offerings. Um, and again, there's just a hair's breadth distinction here in that guilt versus sin has to do with like financial or physical restitution. So if a person sinned unintentionally, and that's important, the unintentional part, he had to present one of these sacrifices in order to make things right with God and to remain a member of the covenant community. If you mess up and you accidentally sin and you don't bring an offering or a, you know, a sacrifice and someone finds out about it, you're going to get at best kicked out of the community and at worst like stoned to death this is very serious um, and we'll talk in a minute about what would be like an unintentional sin so these aren't premeditated acts for the most part if you intentionally premeditate and, and engage in a sin that's been like thought through that's beyond the power of this sacrificial system in Leviticus. And that's interesting, right? Because I did not know that until I really started studying Leviticus. So if you say, I want to murder my neighbor, and then you murder that person, that's an intentional premeditated sin. Now, it's not universal that you could not, you know, make restitution but you would have to first confess so if you did something like that or maybe you know if you have an affair with someone and you plan it out you engage in the illicit act and then it's like oh no i sinned you would go to the high priest and you would have to confess and repent more than likely in front of the entire community with the priest looking on and then sometimes this could be reduced to what they would then call an inadvertent sin and once it got reduced to that then you would engage in this um, bringing of the sin or guilt sacrifice and then you would once again regain your status in community and be considered in right relationship with God so uh and also you're gonna go okay well this is all great but then once we start next week reading about what actually happens with these people like they very rarely seem to either even engage in these kind of things let alone actually get something right so we'll talk about that as we go but this is remember this is like 
the laying down of the law. So this is in a perfect world. If you were truly faithful, these are the kinds of things that you are supposed to be doing. The fact that they don't do them is, well, telling, and it, they're going to experience the consequences of that. So the priests would eat a portion of the sin offering. So remember, we had the whole burnt offering. This all went to God. Then we had sort of the thank, votive, free will offerings, grain offerings. A portion of those offerings would go to the priest for food. And with the free will and thankful offerings, a portion would actually go to the people. But always the best portion would still be burnt up to God. Here, the priests <clears throat> are eating a portion of this offering, but not for food. They're eating it to participate <clears throat> Sorry, in the removal of sin. So they would have to eat this not just in a clean place, but in a holy place, like in the, the holiest area that they could access of the temple. And this, again, signifies that they have a role. This, they're these intercessors, these intermediaries between humankind and God. And so they um, engage in this, which is significant. And if when we get to the New Testament, Jesus is called the perfect high priest. And so we're going to see that Jesus fulfills all of these things for us in the New Testament times. So kind of once we get to the New Testament, it's kind of good to look back at the slide set and that Leviticus because it really helps us understand some of the significance of what Jesus really did for us as a people. So the sin purification offerings provide atonement, again, for unintentional sins. Uh, this category is, again, for no financial restitution. And what type of um, sacrifice you brought depended, again, on your status. So uh, all had to be without defect, but depending on who you are, it's a different animal. So if it's the priest, if it's a priest or the uh, on behalf of the entire nation, it had to be a bull without defect, like the whole burnt offering. If it's a tribal leader, it has to be a male goat without defect. If it's just a lay person, just a normal, ordinary Israelite, it was a female goat or lamb. If it's a poor Israelite, it could be two doves or young pigeons. And if you are extremely poor, you could bring a grain offering without olive oil or incense. Again, here in the middle of Leviticus, which we don't really think of as a book of grace, we see God's grace, that there are different levels of sacrifice required because everyone needs to make a sacrifice to get right with God and right with community, but God's not asking everyone to provide the most expensive. He's making a way so that anybody can engage in this process. So just like the other offerings, the worshiper also participates in the sacrifice. And here the priest collects the blood and he sprinkles it not just on the altar, but actually before the presence of Adonai in front of the veil. And we'll talk about that when we look at, have a diagram of what the tabernacle looked like. Then he would put some of the blood on the horns of the altar, pour the rest at the base of the altar, Again, burn the fatty portion because the fatty portion always goes to God. He would eat his portion, again, in a holy place. So inside the tabernacle, not just in the temple grounds, but inside the actual building. And then the carcass, the leftover, the, the bones and, you know, the parts that you can't use, goes outside of the camp altogether into the wilderness where it is burned. The wilderness signifies evil, evil spirits. Um, it, it, wilderness is bad when we ever see it come up, especially in these Old Testament books. And so they take it out to the very edge, out of the community altogether, because again, this signifies sin. And so they don't want any of it to remain within the community. All of it needs to be used up. And so the carcass goes way outside the community where it is burnt. How much of the sacrifice is eaten? depends on who did the sinning. So if it's uh, the high priest that sins, the high priest is like the most holy person in the nation of Israel. So it's bad if this, the, if he has to offer a sacrifice. Um, and then if it's the entire covenant community, none of the offering would actually be eaten. So remember that I said the priests eat a portion of the offering. Well, 
they are doing it because they're the intermediaries between God and the rest of the people. But there's nobody in between the high priest and God. The high priest is as high as it gets. And so if he's involved at all, there's no one higher than him to participate in removing the sin. And so all the offering is either burned up to God or thrown out into the wilderness and burned out there. If it's a tribal leader or just a regular old Israelite, um, again, a portion is eaten by the priests in the tabernacle because they're participating in the removal of the sin because they have that authority to do so. The, uh, the idea is that the higher the standing of the person, the more potent the pollution that's released by sin. And also, there's no one else to be able to remove this sin. So here, there's so much significance about Jesus Christ again, because the human high priest is the most holy person in the entire world. And if there, there's no one that can then remove his sin, but Jesus is going to come and have that authority to remove He's the high priest, but he's the perfect high priest, the high priest that is free from sin. And so he really is able to remove all of our sin. He participates in the removal of the sin by being the offering itself. So I don't want to get too far ahead, but just kind of trying to link a little bit what we're going to talk about when we get to the New Testament and talk about Jesus' sacrifice for us. So the guilt or trespass offering is very similar to what we just talked about, but this is for, like I said, where restitution is involved, financial restitution. Usually it's a monetary pay payment, but you know, it could be like, I accidentally ran over your dog with my cart. And so I'm going to either give you a new dog or I'm going to pay for you or give you money for it. Uh, again, the offering depends on who you are. Um, the worshiper also participates in the sacrifice. The priest engages in the same process for this type. It's really just, they're both sin offerings. It's just one is distinct because restitution is part of the process. So a lot about sacrifices here. What is the underlying meaning to all of this? Well, sacrifices remind the people that they are called to be holy. They are called to be set apart. And remember, the people themselves are called by God in Exodus to be a nation of priests. So if we think of it on this continuum, this hierarchy, you have all the people living in the world at the time, most of whom don't believe in the one true God of Israel. Then you have the Israelites set apart as this holy nation meant to be this priesthood. So they're the intercessors for the rest of the world. Then within the nation of Israel, you have the Levitical priesthood. These are the people that are the intercessors between Israel and God. And then at the top of that, you have the high priest who is, again, the closest, you know, most holy human being that exists at the time. And he makes intercession for the rest of the priests to God. And then there's no one there between the high priest and God. And the sacrifices are about paying the penalty for sin. Sin is separation from God. It is going back to that idea of the Garden of Eden, where humankind wants to be like God, um, wants to go their own way, does not want to be obedient to what they think of as silly laws or regulations that don't make sense. And so they go and do their own thing, and that creates a rift, a tear in relationship. And so a penalty needs to be paid to make that relationship right again. And it's also these sacrifices are a substitution for punishment. So the penalty for sin is death, death of whoever engaged in the sin. But God is a God of grace and mercy. And so he provides this sacrificial system as a substitution so that it's not Adam and Eve that are killed as they should have been. They deserve death. That's the penalty for sin. But instead, God himself sacrificed an animal and then used the skin of that animal to make a covering for Adam and Eve to provide for his beloved children. So the sacrifice pays the penalty and becomes the substitution for the punishment that is really ours to bear. But because God loves us, 
God doesn't make us bear that punishment. Now, hold that thought because you're going to see punishment in the Old Testament and you're going to see God punish people. And sometimes people do die. Sometimes they have horrible things that happen to them because of sin. And we'll talk about why that is when, when we talk about those specific sins. But remember, this is the ideal world here. This is the rule book. If, if you do all of these things, this is how it's going to go for you. And finally, the sacrifices remove the pollution of sin. So if you remember back to Adam and Eve, sin created a rift not just between Adam and Eve and God, but between Adam and Eve themselves and between Adam and Eve and creation. And I would even add another level, which is within themselves, it creates a rift, right? Where there's this hole that opens up in our bodies because we are not the, our full potential. We're not what God created us to be because sin separates us from that. And so all of that pollution needs to be removed. The penalty needs to be paid. It's made by the substitution of an animal's blood. And then that stain is removed so that everything can be healed again. So it makes you right, not just with God, but with the rest of your community and even within yourself. And so that uncleanliness of sin is removed so that the people can be in holy standing once more. So I, I talked a little bit about Christ and what he does. You can look through this slide on your own. We'll talk about this again when we get to the New Testament. So Aaron, there's also um, quite a lengthy part of Leviticus dedicated to Aaron and his sons and their ordination. We saw also provisions for ordination in Exodus. So we get it repeated again here in the book of law and worship. It's lengthy and detailed for a reason because the people are meant to hold the priests accountable to make sure that they are engaging in these processes and that they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Because if God had just given this information to the priests and said to the people, well, you just need to trust that the priests are doing what they are supposed to be doing, then the people would have had a lot of excuses. Well, if the priests aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, then how are we supposed to remain holy and free from sin? So God is holding everyone accountable here. So not only is this the rule book, it's also meant so that they can hold everyone in their community accountable for what they're supposed to be doing. So there's four main components to ordination, and it sounds a lot like what's going on with sin offerings. So there's a washing because we're purifying the spirit, Remember, the priesthood is like the next level. So we've got the rest of the world. We have Israelite, which is the priest system for the rest of the world. They're the intercessors for the world. And then amongst the Israelites, uh, the, the Levites are the intercessors for them. So they need to be the purest and the most holy of this holy nation of Israel. Um, then they have special garments that they wear. These are meant to reflect their status, their office. Um, they didn't have shoes, just garments. They probably ministered barefoot. If you uh, recall the calling of Moses in the early part of Exodus, he takes off his sandals because he's standing on holy ground. So there's this idea that nothing is to become between you and this holy ground upon which you're ministering. They are anointed, which signifies that these people are chosen by God and set apart for the specific work of serving as priests to the priesthood of the Israelites. And then they engage in the sacrificial system. This is their daily job. Um, and so they themselves have to present sacrifices because they are guilty and sinners as well. Everybody is. Every human being is a sinner. Even the high priest has to atone for his sin. And so they also need forgiveness and need to make this substitution for the, the punishment that they deserve. Then the blood of the offering is applied to the right ear, so this means they must be ever attentive, to the thumb of their right hand, they are to be every, ever ready to do God's work, and to their right big toe, ever alert to run and go in service of, of God. And I'll let you look at this in detail yourself, but you can see um, this is what their garments looked like, and it gives you some details about everything. So um, ritual purity is another component. So we've got the sacrificial system. 
but we also have this idea of being pure or clean versus unclean. This idea goes back to the holiness of God. God is holy. If you've taken this class from me before, you've heard me describe it as fire. God is like fire and fire is so wonderful. It warms us. It cooks our food. It, you know, helps us shape tools and create things. But if we put our hand into fire, we are going to get burned. It's not the fault of the fire. It's our fault because we don't have proper protection. And if I put my hand in there, it's going to get burned no matter what. But if I have some kind of fireproof glove or some kind of protection on me, then I can put my hands into the fire, not forever, but for a little bit, and I can still be safe. Similar idea is going on here. God is so holy. It's not that God can't, you know, can't stand human beings and just wants to smite us all because we're just so unholy and gross. No, God is so holy that if we come into the presence of God as unholy people, we're going to get burned up like if we put our hand into fire, unless we have some sort of protection. So think of Leviticus as God providing this protection because God loves God's people. God wants to live amongst them. That was the whole idea of the Garden of Eden as God was walking and talking with Adam and Eve. And God desperately desires relationship with us, which is truly astounding when you think about it. And so God wants the people to have this protection so that when God is in their midst, they will not burn up because they're in the midst of something so holy. And so the people have to prepare themselves and make themselves pure so that they can safely enter into the holy presence of God. Um, and it, you know, it reminds us as well in these, these purification processes, it was meant to remind them of this. Always as humans, we need to remember that God is holy and perfect, that everything that we have is from God, even things that have come about because of our own abilities and intellect. Well, who gave us the abilities and intellect? Who gave us the freedom to be able to be fruitful and multiply and recreate and do wonderful things in this world? God did. So everything comes from God. And so when we talk about clean versus unclean, sometimes we in modern day times think of unclean as bad, especially having just gone through this pandemic where, you know, all of a sudden we're like back out in the world and it's like, I need to be armed with 90 canisters of hand sanitizer because I feel like everything is dirty everywhere I look. Um, that's not what's going on here. It's not that uncleanliness is bad. Uncleanliness is part of being human. Um, if you, you know, read in detail in Leviticus, it's all, it's related to like emissions from the body, um, thing, you know, fluid a lot of times or blood or things that just, we are humans. We bleed, our noses run, we get sores, um, we get sicknesses, we engage in intimate relations, which involves exchanging fluids. I mean, this is all part of what it means to be a human being. And so it's not necessarily bad to be unclean. It doesn't mean that you are dirty on the inside. It just means that you need to go through the purification process because if you enter God in this quote unquote unclean state, it's not going to be safe for you. So holiness is determined by some, a couple of different things. Again, it's kind of like this hierarchy, just like we talked about intercession and in, being an intermediary for God, you know, standing between God and someone else. The same is true with this idea of holiness. So it, it gets holier as we go. So if we look at spaces pertaining just to Israel, we have the sanctuary, the tabernacle itself. That's the, the most holy place. Then we have the camp, it's, which is more holy than everything outside of it. And then we have what I was telling you about, that wilderness, which is just, that's the place where evil and darkness lies. As far as people go, the priests are the most holy. Talked about why that is. Then the people of Israel. Then the people who are temporarily unclean. A lot of times those people are sent to be outside the camp again for safety and protection, but not forever. There were ways to get invited back into the midst of the community. If you were sick or you had a sore, it was like, go outside the camp, not out into the wilderness, just right outside the camp border. 
hang out there and once the sore goes away once you're better you can come back into the camp and resume you know your life in community and then there were what was considered unclean spirits and those were said to inhabit the wilderness and those are things that are never going to be clean or holy within the priesthood holiness also has a hierarchy so we'll look at the diagram of the temple of sorry the tabernacle the holy of holies is the most holy place and because of that only the high priest is allowed to go into the holy holies and only once a year after a lengthy purification process and this is because god has ordained it only reason he's allowed to go in there any other day of the year he's going to burn up if he does it the sanctuary is the next holy place and all the priests are allowed into this space and then there's the inner court so again we'll look at this diagram and that's where the all the tribe of levites is allowed to be so that day that i was talking about that day when the high priest could go into the holy of holies is called yom kippur it is still celebrated today by people of the jewish faith and in leviticus it's chapter 16. this was to occur on the 10th day of the seventh month every single year and it was significant because it was this catch-all the high priest is being ordained by God to offer a sacrifice for the entire community to cover all of the sin and uncleanliness that it's occurred in the past year including his own sin and uncleanliness and so um, if this was part of your assigned reading so if you notice there's also this scapegoat so not only is a sacrifice being made but there's what's called the scapegoat and the scapegoat the high priest puts his hand on the scapegoat and kind of confesses the sins of the entire community onto this animal and then the animal is sent out into the wilderness again carrying the uncleanliness the sin the wrongdoing the separation away from the people so that once again they can be in right relationship with God so when we get to Jesus we're gonna see that not only is Jesus called the perfect high priest he's also the perfect sacrifice he's also often referred to as this idea of a scapegoat where he is not only the sacrifice for the sins but he's also taking the sins of the world away and out into the wilderness and so when we look at the events of the crucifixion we will notice he is crucified outside of the city of Jerusalem in the wilderness so that's significant because again he's carrying the sins of the people out into the wilderness there's several other festivals and feasts and sacred days that happen including the Passover which we learned about in Exodus um, and so I'll let you look at these on your own and if you have any questions let me know we can talk about it in zoom um, and then there's some special days the Sabbath of course we know because that we learned about that in Genesis 1 but there's also Sabbath years so every seventh year the fields were to be rested uh, remember that God does not just care for human beings God cares for all of creation human beings are special and set apart we're the pinnacle of creation but God also cares for the land and for animals and so he provides provision for them to be rested as well then they had what's called the year of Jubilee where every 50th year debts would be canceled all slaves would be liberated and land had to be returned to the its rightful family so in the ancient near east israelite culture land was something that god gave to you and it was yours by birthright you could lease it or sell it sometimes even lose it depending on what you did but for financial reasons families would sometimes lease their land because they had no other means of making money but every 50th year it was to be returned back to the rightful birthright owner of that land um, slavery in the ancient Near East a lot of times slaves indentured themselves just like they would lease or sell land they would lease themselves into slavery if they um, needed to get some money if they had no other financial means for themselves uh, but again the idea is that no human being actually really owns any of this it's all given to us by God people belong to God ultimately and so this year of Jubilee kind of cancels everything out and makes everything right
And then um, there's two festivals, Purim and Hanukkah, which are going to come later. Uh, we'll talk about Purim when we look at the book of Esther, and we'll talk about Hanukkah when we get to the intertestamental period, because this festival has to do with what happens in that time period. So a recap, Leviticus helps us to understand the sacrificial nature of Christ. So we will need to remember what we've learned here when we get to the New Testament and the Gospels. It also teaches us about God's holiness, which is so interesting because I don't think many of us associate God's holiness with the book of Leviticus. When we read it, especially in modern times, it just seems like a lot of crazy rules and hard things and this talk of uncleanliness makes us uncomfortable and it's just so far removed from the way we operate in our day and time that we don't necessarily see God's holiness at first and yet it's there. It's there in the way that God, you know, ordains that different types of animals or sacrifices can be made depending on your status. It's, it's ingrained in the sacrificial system itself because God does not have to provide this. The penalty for sin is death. And yet God does not want that because God wants a relationship with human beings. God wants us to fulfill our purpose, which is to be mediators and caretakers for creation. And so God provides all of this as a means of it's a means of grace. It's a way to have relationship with God. When we get to the New Testament, it's going to be a relationship that becomes our means of grace. A relationship with Jesus Christ is the way to have a relationship with God. But in the Old Testament, because Christ hasn't come yet, it's the law. Um, remember, God's wrath normally occurs where there's persistent, willful, premeditated sin and refusal to make amends. Often it's not just a single incident that results in the wrath of God, although sometimes it is. But, and I, I will say, and you, if you find something that count, contradicts me, this isn't anything I've read in studying. This is just what I've gleaned from my own study of scripture, that if it's immediate punishment for one single instance, it's always involving a leader or a person who knew the covenant conditions had entered into the covenant willingly and should have known better. And so we'll look at those examples as we go through the Old Testament. Leviticus 17.11 says the life of an animal is in its blood. So when an animal's blood is poured out in sacrifice, like I said, that's the element of substitution. But this is also important. This isn't just, you know, a one for one exchange here. God in God's grace decides to receive the sacrifice. God created the system. And so it's God's initiative to grant forgiveness. You cannot bring a sacrifice and on the inside be like, whatever, this is stupid and I don't need this and I didn't do anything wrong. And yet on the outside, you know, you're helping the priest slaughter the animal. God's going to say no to that because your heart is not right. Person's attitudes and reasons and motivation has to also be right. You have to be humble. You have to be contrite. You have to desire to repair your relationship with God. And we'll see this come out um, in the time of the kings and especially in the words that the prophets have to say because we're going to see God say, yeah, you made all the right sacrifices. You did everything that I told you to do, but yet you were horrible people. You oppressed your neighbor. You murdered one another. You worshipped other gods. So you can't do all that and then show up at, at the temple with your sacrifice and expect that that's going to make it okay. It's not enough. If I receive your sacrifice, it's always an act of, of God's grace to receive that. So people never saved by their own efforts, no matter what. <laughs> it's only and always by the grace of God. Everyone deserves condemnation and death for sin. We will see this repeated in the New Testament. But God is gracious and willing to forgive on the basis of faith. Faith as evidenced through following the law in the Old Testament. And when we get to the New Testament, faith as evidenced by our relationship with Jesus Christ. God provided in the Old Testament 
and the new, a means for redemption. God doesn't just say, oh, too bad, you're human beings, you're terrible, you're all sinful, and just away with you, I'm going to figure something else out. God provided then and now a means for redemption. These are God's covenant people. So they are going to be held to a higher account than all the rest of the world. <laughs> all the rest of the world doesn't yet know God. That's the whole point of Israel is to make God known to them. And so they enter into this special covenant relationship. So yes, they are called God's beloved. They are called God's holy. They are his most favored and treasured peoples of all the earth. But it's because of the covenant relationship not because of who they were. It's not like God chose Israel because they were the most amazing people. They were the best people at the time, and then God enters into relationship with them. This is God chose Israel precisely to show God's grace. If he was going to choose the best and the brightest and the most glamorous of the ancient Near East, God would have picked Egypt, <laughs> but God didn't. God picked these lowly people that had become enslaved to Egypt. So really the lowest of the low in the ancient Near Eastern times. He chose them, formed them into a people, gave them this leader that had a stutter and wasn't even sure he wanted to be a leader. And oh, by the way, had engaged in manslaughter and then had been living in the desert for 40 years. And God raises him up to be the leader of this people. And then God brings along with the Israelites that had been slaves, other people. There were Egyptians that saw what was happening and decided to follow God. There were people living in other areas that probably joined in in the great exodus because they saw what God had done. And so God unites these disparate people by the terms of the covenant to show that it is not about the people. It's not that they are so amazing. They're no more or less amazing than anybody else that was living in the ancient Near East. God is amazing and God chooses the least and the last and the lost to become this nation of priests who will then supposed to be intercessors for the rest of the world. And so they're bound by the terms of these laws. They agree to them. They agree and they know that there are rewards. Rewards meaning you get to be this priesthood and have this intimate relationship with God and God's going to live amongst your midst and you're going to get to go into the promised land. Pretty awesome. But there's also punishment involved. If you don't hold to these terms, if you don't follow this law, if you don't do what I'm saying and you become disobedient and you don't make restitution when you're a disobedient, then there's going to be punishment. So we're going to see what that looks like once they set off for the promised land. Some difficult things to read in Leviticus. We have the instance of Aaron's sons offering the fire. So here's an example of, you know, we never, we don't hear that they've done this time and time again and God finally like gets mad and burns them up. This is a one-time sin which enacts immediate punishment, but there's a reason for it. Aaron's sons at this point had been ordained. They had gone through that whole ordination process to purify themselves. They knew the laws and the rules, and they broke them. So when it says they offer unauthorized and profane offering, this means it's fire that is not kindled from the altar of God. But this is a fire that they just made. So it's not a holy fire. Remember, you can't bring the unholy into the holy and expect that it's going to be okay. Then it's said that they offered this before the Lord, which more than likely means they went into the most holy place, that place where only the high priest is allowed to go once a year after like a, a week long purification process. And they just take this fire of their own making that's not holy and they themselves go into the most holy place. And so instantly they are burned up because they are putting their whole bodies into the fire and without the protection that they knew that they needed. So that's why that punishment is so harsh and so quick. Then we also read that God, or Moses on behalf of God, tells Aaron that he's not allowed to mourn. And that, to me, when I first saw it, seemed very harsh. Like how can a father not mourn for his children, even if they did do the wrong thing, and even if Aaron knew that they deserved the punishment they got? he's human and presumably loved his children and what parent doesn't mourn for the loss of their children. But here 
Moses is saying, you are the high priest. You're held to a different standard. And if you mourn, the rest of the community is going to go, oh, God shouldn't have done that. How could God do that to Aaron's sons? It's so terrible. And so Aaron is not allowed to publicly mourn. Mourning in the ancient Near East was a public thing. In our day and time, it's a private thing. And that's not what Moses is talking about. Moses is talking about the public face of mourning, wearing sackcloth, putting ashes on your head, going about moaning and wailing in the streets. And, you know, there's something to be said for public mourning. But no, not the time and place for that discussion. Maybe we can talk about it in Zoom. Um, so he's saying, Aaron, you cannot publicly mourn because then it's somehow implying that God was wrong and God was not wrong. This is what those boys deserved because they knew better. Or they probably weren't boys. They were men by this point. Um, so then you might ask, as I did, okay, but Aaron made the golden calf, remember? Oh, sorry, Moses, the people all gave me their gold and I just threw them into the fire. And guess what? This calf just pops out. Well, obviously that's not true. Aaron shaped the people's gold into a calf that then everybody was worshiping at the foot of Mount Sinai. So how come when that happened, God didn't instantly burn up Aaron? Well, Aaron had not yet been consecrated as a priest. The Levitical laws had not yet been recounted to the people. Remember at the time, Moses is up on the mountain and God's handing the law down to him. So he didn't know yet all the rules. He knew some. He knew that it was wrong to worship another god. But the, the commandments hadn't been given to him yet. And he had not been consecrated. So had he been consecrated, had this happened after the reading of the Ten Commandments and after the creation of the tabernacle and God inhabiting the tabernacle as he did at the end of Exodus, then yes, Aaron would have been burned up instantly. Um, and then finally, in verse 19 of that chapter, it says that Aaron doesn't eat his priestly portion because he is fasting from grief. That's a private thing. The rest of the community is not seeing this because Aaron, as a priest, would have been eating that portion inside the tabernacle where most people could not see what was happening. And so that private grief is acceptable because, of course, God understands and Moses as well that you are, you know, as a father, you need to grieve your children. But it needs to be done as a leader of the community privately, privately. And then finally, we have Leviticus 24. This is a blasphemer that is stoned to death by all the people. Super harsh. I can I, Aaron's kids like make sense to me. The stoning someone to death makes my stomach hurt. I cannot imagine having to do this. And so we might rightly question, why do the people have to be a part of this God? Like, why can't the priests as your representatives do this part? Why does everyone need to do it? Well, because the punishment is meant to be a deterrent for everybody in the community, a reminder that you cannot engage in willful sin without meeting the punishment. Remember, he, I talked about it, unintentional sin versus intentional sin. This was intentional sin. The, the blasphemer never repented of it. Had he repented, then you know, he probably could have then brought his sin offering and everything be, been made right, but he doesn't. And so all the community participates to show that this is not acceptable and also to show that the community is responsible for one another. This is tough, especially for American and have grown up here and have had this kind of independent, pull up your bootstraps, do your own thing mentality, which I think has gone haywire in our modern times. And we've lost sight of, of this sense of um, connection to the rest of our community, that we do in fact owe things to one another when we're in especially a covenant community. If you think of a covenant relationship like a marriage, there are things owed to one another in that relationship. And that's true in this community of God's people. And so a sin like this stains the entire community unless they're, they're willing to deal with it. It's one of the awful truths of being in a position of leadership is that that means that we have to lead. And sometimes that means we have to mete out punishment when it is due. So here is a diagram of the tabernacle. So you can see here, we've got our little, our man and his ox or what is that? 
uh, bowl that he's bringing for sacrifice. Sorry, I should put my glasses on when I look at this. And then we have multiple slaughtering tables. So multiple priests could have been preparing sacrifices at the same time. Then you've got the altar in the middle, which is where the fatty portion or the whole animal would be burnt up, depending on what type of sacrifice you have. You have that brazen laver, laver. This is where they would do any kind of ceremonial washing or get the water to wash off the parts of the animal. And then within the courtyard, you have the actual, you know, temple or tabernacle. And so this, if you can see that number three, that's the curtain that divides the whole, most holy place, the Holy of Holies, from the rest of the tabernacle or temple. The temple's going to look just like this. It's just going to be a more permanent structure. And so that veil, only once a year was the high priest allowed to go behind that. And um, in the most holy place is the Ark of the Covenant. It's also the mercy seat. This is where God's presence is said to reside. And so when Aaron's sons entered that unlawfully, of course they got burnt up. They were putting themselves into fire without any kind of protection. So only the high priest, once a year after a lengthy, week-long purification process, and then invited to do so by God is allowed to enter beyond that veil and be in the very presence of God. And I'll let you look at um, that in detail. You might want to study that if you're interested in these kind of things. And then here's kind of a top down view. Same thing, just showing you all the different pieces and um, significant things that were in the tabernacle. All right, so I am going to stop this because it's been a, a you know longer, and um, I, this will just be its own so that you can watch or listen to it on its own. And then I think I'll be able to do numbers and Deuteronomy as part two. So I'll see you soon for part two, numbers and Deuteronomy.